What we do here matters, because what we don't do matters even more. We need to continue to push, and we at ADAO are going to continue to push the Surgeon General of the United States. As you know, the United States continues to use asbestos, and that indeed is a barrier to others stopping its use. The most horrific part of this whole story is that it is preventable. Thank you. It's uh, Rob Smith from the Valley Dam Foundation in Australia. Uh, my question is to John Thayer. Whilst it was extremely disturbing to see what's under the ground, um, and obviously catastrophic for anyone who works there, having been involved in the air conditioning industry for the best part of 30 years, what would concern me is what is inside the air conditioning ducting. Um, assuming in America that, like Australia, do use a lot of, do use a lot of asbestos in insulation, in, and my experience in Australia is that the old insulation is actually dropping out and being blown through the old systems. Has there been any record of that happening? No, because inside the buildings, it's yes. the phone, John. What they, what they usually do is they cut off the air shafts so that the temperatures in the tunnel get up to 160 degrees. All, our, all the buildings are supplied through a chill water system. Most, mostly everything in that is cork insulation. They're very careful about what's inside the buildings. But there, was, there is asbestos blowing through some of the grates. We, we proved that. but. All they did was cut the grates off and cover them up, so nothing could go out. That's why the temperatures got so hot in the steam tunnels. I want to add to that. I could have talked long. I'm sorry it went long. I might talk, but uh, we're supposed to cut off the HVAC in our work here when they take down things like fireproofing pipe insulation. It's actually two layers of six mil polyethylene and seal off the air conditioning vents. Mm -hmm. It's called critical barriers. It's not always happening. As a matter of fact, in Georgia, a contractor was nailed to a fireproofing removal job and completely inundated an air conditioning system and all the air handling equipment. It all had to be replaced. This is a, if, if, if any what we call class one or class two work is performed without shutting off the HVAC, you're risking the indoor environment and the indoor quality of the contamination. Thank you. Good point. Dr. Weber. Jim Weber from the uh, country of New York. Um, <laughs> Tom, can you tell us a little bit about the attitude of students who come in for your uh, courses on asbestos handling, what it's like today versus maybe 20 years ago? Why, Jim, that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, it's different. Uh, when we first got into the asbestos game, uh, back when AHERA and the schools rolled, starting in 82, um, we were dealing with primarily larger projects where you were scraping down miles of soundproofing and fireproofing and pipe insulation. We were scared of this stuff. People took showers, they followed regulations. It was monstrous. Um, then after the AHERA bubble ended, the great floor tile panic erupted, and what happened is ever since we started doing renovation work with floor tiles and wall boards and roofing, uh, people have forgotten how to do these projects. And what's happened is the students that come along now aren't thinking about this. They're thinking, it's not the question of how do I protect people, it's why do I have to do all of that, or do you, are you sure that this is what I have to do? Do I really have to use that respirator? Are you sure where is that written? I mean, it's an absolute, arm wrestling match with some students. I mean, we go through, we go through the full-blown respiratory protection uh, lecture in the supervisor class, and I've had guys sit in the back of the room and slam their hands down and say, we don't have to do all that stuff, that's crazy. I've never seen anybody do that. When all I've done to them is explain them what the federal regs are. Let me add something to that. Because we, we just had a, uh, a raid on a school in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, 
uh, it was actually a lead training program, but it's similar. And uh, they were selling certificates to immigrant workers, the non-documented workers. So it, there's a racket in this game, too. That, uh, and if the workers are not, don't fully appreciate what, what they're getting themselves into, then they'll buy a ticket. Yeah. Uh, it's most of, our, most of our young Spanish speaking and other language uh, speaking workers uh, can't read their own language. So when we teach them in Spanish, we have, I know a number of uh, people that do Spanish language training. They don't even know their own language to teach things like, you know, they're supposed to be supervisors and they're supposed to know English, how to even read a material safety data sheet. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, I could spend an hour here just give you those stories. And, and Tom, I think you're right. It, it can go on and on, which is tragic. We will have two questions that we'll take, and then we're going to move on to what I know you'll have to take it up in the bar. Oh, Dr. Kasselman, is that your? Dr. Kasselman has, like, rights here. Jim, I just wondered if you uh, seen any evidence that the uh, New York State talc with all that asbestos in it was used in cosmetic products or baby powder. Do you know about that? As far as I know, it wasn't. We're going to take two more quick questions, but before we do that, we do want to update you because Jim Millett, Sean, and Veritas were the three labs we used for product testing, and just so in case somebody said what actually happened, it took 18 months of product testing. We had a press conference, hand-delivered reports to CPSC and EPA, and I coined a new expression, no response is a response. We had no action and no follow-through. Ultimately, it took litigation to work with uh, Planet Toys through CBS. The uh, toy was removed and it took months and hundreds of thousands of dollars and children were exposed. That's what happened there. Uh, question? Christine Winter from the United Kingdom. Can I just ask a quick question about asbestos in schools? The people who are responsible for managing it in the schools, are they able to get insurance to cover them in the United States? You're talking about the contractors themselves? I'm not I'm sorry, are you talking about contractors being able to get insurance? They have to, uh, there's a process of general liability policies and then they have to get what's called pollution coverage and they have to pursue that and it's a matter of uh, qualifying based on their history of claims, insurability and the like. I'm not sure if that answers your question or not, but go ahead. Yeah, there, there is supposed to be someone designated in each school district who oh. is responsible for managing this uh, this, this whole business, the AHERA enforcement. And what we found again in this report was many of the school districts had not even designated such a person. So there was nobody, there was nobody who, there either was no one at all who was responsible or there was no one who had been trained even if they had been designated as responsible. So they're supposed to be the ones who supervise the contractors. Mm -hmm. And instead what happens is the contractor is is calling the shots, you know. So my question, oh, I, I assume everyone knows who I am. Right. Anne Samuelson from the country of Oregon. Um, we, uh, I sort of run a school board for four counties for an education service district, and I would think that as a school board member, this is something that should be coming before me as a decision maker within the district. I kind of, it, it just feels like that part of the loop isn't there. So is, how does that happen, or do you make that happen, or do you it does. If, if, for instance, there is a, an inspection by the state and a, a, a letter of non-compliance is sent to the school district, the school district then replies to the state agency, we're going to take this to the, um, to the school board and, and then we find out the school board has said, no, we don't have enough money to pay for that. And that's the end of it because the state agency then does not follow the next step. Right? So, there are some, there are some relatively wealthy towns where, in which these issues are dealt with very quickly, and then there are other cities and towns that uh, either are too cheap or don't want to or don't have the resources to do it. And, but we had no way, well, now that the union is involved, the story may change. But, but before that, with simply the state being uh, necessary, uh, they, they, won't, they won't take any further action.
I just noticed a recurring theme in all the talks that we just presented in this session. Uh, when it comes to asbestos, people don't want to know it's there. When it comes to asbestos, they say, leave it alone and you won't get hurt. And that's, that's pretty much the equivalent of sticking your head in the sand. And the easiest bird to kill is one with his head in the sand. Well, that's the quote like the war quote. The, 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 um, thank you. Round of applause for